Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where in this wonderful world you might be. Thank you for making the Highbury Squad part of your day. We thought this day would never come, but it's finally here. One week to go until the Arsenal are back in action in the Premier League. Let's rock and roll, people! Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Evening, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. No matter where in the world you might be, thank you for joining us back. Here's my podcast brother from another mother, Mr. Super Kev, Super Kevin Campbell. Good to be back. Hello, 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 squaddies. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us on Monday Madness. And you know what comes next? At ease, squaddies. At ease. And you recognise this man. If you do not know who he is, what Arsenal rock have you been sleeping under? He's back for another round, another session. He's going to alleviate all of your transfer woes, or will he? Kaya from Football London, back in the house. Welcome. Woo! Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that lovely bidding. That's a big, big reputation to live up to, but hopefully I can answer as many of your questions as possible tonight. You can. Um, good evening to the usual suspects. Our chief like officer, Tammy, is in the house. Uh, Lynn is here. Uh, Mel, um, our Malaysian gooner, is here. Now, this is one of my favourites, Kaya. Schrodinger's cat's flap. I don't <laughs> know what that means. Um We've got Guna Russ in the house. Welcome, Guna Russ. Arnie's here. Newman is here. Ian is here. The Flying Dutchman is here. Everybody is here. Um, right, brilliant stuff. You're going to want to stay tuned until the very end of the show because the Highbury squad, Mr. Super Kevin Campbell, the legend in the house, is going to give away another joyous, delicious, beautiful Highbury squad coin thanks to our good friends over at Zenith Kai. I'm not sure if you've seen this puppy, but he's a beauty. It is an that absolute is beauty. And yeah. of course, you hang out with Arsenal all the time. And we've partnered up with Zenith, who are the official partners of our beloved club. You can go during the show and 90 minutes plus three after 30% off HS30. Get your Arsenal coin. People are loving it. The football is back. Before we get stuck in, Kev, how excited are you for the Arsenal to be back and Boxing Day football to be back and the Premier League to be back? I'm, I'm not, to be honest. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm ecstatic, so let's be honest. About time. Listen, the World Cup was fine and all that. What an absolutely unbelievable final, but nothing beats the Arsenal. Come on, mate. Come on, you gunners. Come on. Nothing does. And uh, look, I'm sure people are fed up of hearing about the World Cup final. Um, but, you know, glad everyone enjoyed it, ready to move on. Beautiful scenes. You know, the... Uh, I'll say something. that The adulation for Messi, all a bit scary. But hey, you know what? When you're the greatest footballer that's ever lived, I'm sh it, is, uh, it is bound, I'm, bound I'm to arguably, happen. Arguably, come on. Arguably, come on. Are you a Maradona Argu guy? You a Maradona guy, Kev? No, I'm Pele. I'm Pele. Pele. Kaya, are you a Maradona, Pele or Messi or Probably Ronaldo guy? Each of the players I've seen the most, I think Messi for me. I think the fact that he's been able to win pretty much everything in the game and the fact that he's able to... I, for Personally, it's, it's the guy who, who's given me the most joy watching football. And for that reason, it's, it's Messi for me. Yeah. I was having this conversation with Tom Canton and uh, Dan Potts yesterday, and I think it's a generational thing as well. That's, yeah, I that's think a lot right. of gener that's Generation right. Xers are Maradona. They, I mean, seeing Maradona play, it was unbelievable. Uh, the goal, I still think the goal against England, the second goal is the greatest World Cup goal ever scored. So I do think it's a generational thing. And next week, we're going to have a show on the Highbury squad where we have different generational fans, generational fans, who uh, we're going to talk. It's called The Goat Show. I'm going to have a discussion about who we think is the best and why. It's not a boring conversation. And the reason why so many people are having it is because it always ends up in a ruck and it's interesting. Plus, I'd love to see, um, you know, a few people go at it. Right, Kaya. Arsenal Football Club, massive few months coming. Uh, you've been with the team, uh, the Dubai Cup. Uh, you've been in some of the presses. You were at the Juventus game uh, the other day with your hot chocolate. Hopefully your hot chocolate. <laughs> yes. um, if you can just, in a nutshell, real quick, 
before we get stuck into the juice that the listeners want. How's it been? What's the vibe? What's your take? Talk us, put us in that press room or, you know, that fly on the wall scenario. Yeah, it's been good. Obviously, the result against Juventus wasn't what anyone wanted in terms of a 2-0 defeat, but it was kind of a a weird result in that I think Juventus had three shots in the entire game. They hardly came forward and I think they scored two own goals on the day. So it was one of them where Arsenal were definitely on top and the two Dubai games were very promising. I think um, the team have come back with a sort of desire to maintain the intensity that we saw before they left. I think Martin Odegaard has really been the leader of that. If you see him around the training camp, he's definitely the one leading things on the training ground and Arteta has been very clear that he wants to keep that intensity going because it's difficult with so many players away at the World Cup and different players come back at different times and I guess it's like normal summer pre-seasons but it's quite difficult to to get that going and to try and keep that uh, level maintained but hopefully Arsenal have managed to manage this this little break well I think a lot of the young players who've come in have done pretty well if you look at the likes of Lino Souza, Ruel Walters, Armario Cozio do recall the eye on uh on Saturday, and I think Ethan Winery, who scored for the the twenty ones tonight, if I'm not mistaken, is also also caught the eye on Saturday. So it's a really exciting time to see a lot of the youngsters playing, and I think a good good few games to build up for Arsenal. A, a nice mixture of sort of seeing what they're good at and reminding us what they're good at, but also reminding us what they need to work on. And, and I think that's probably what Mikel Arteta would have wanted from those three games. Are we worried at all, Kev, about the result? We, you know, we often discuss pre-season and we we don't necessarily talk about all the results mattering, but it's the togetherness. You've been through it. You take us take us behind the white lines. Does a game like that leading up to a game against West Ham, a London derby, um, does it matter, the result against Juventus? Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. I don't think the, the result matters, but it does matter just from a momentum p- uh, point of view. But you could see there, were, there weren't there were a lot of the, the, the main players playing. Um, a lot of the lads who played at the World Cup got a rest kind of thing. So they're going to build up, they're going to build into the West Ham game. You know, most of those players who, who, who started won't be, won't be starting against West Ham. So I just think, it's a great opportunity to see some of the youngsters. It's a great opportunity to give the youngsters a goal back at the Emirates with a crowd there because some of those youngsters done so well in Dubai. I think, that, you know, they've they, they done a, a really good job. But it just goes to show they're not quite there yet. And, and unless we're playing with our, as full a side as we can, we can get some weird results. Although, listen, the team played okay and maybe shouldn't have lost the game. But that's the way it goes sometimes. This, this is going to be the part the proof will be in this second half final act pudding, Kaya and Kev, that we were all dreading in that. How is this World Cup going to affect um, the rest of our season? So I've broken the show up into a couple of segments. So we're going to talk transfers first, and it's in particular some of the names that we're linked with. And then we're going to do a quick fire um, top five players and top five on the gaffer. Um, I want to get your guys' take on some of my thoughts and questions going into the final act. Right, Kaya, um, Kev and I have talked quite a bit about the players that we would like to see at the club. Around this time last year, Kev was asked on our show how many players we need to really turn this team around. And at the time... He didn't say this in one window, but he said minimum eight. And I think that was after the Ramsdale, um, Benjamin White, Tomiyasu window Mm -hmm. um, and kind of building on those players. And of course, at the time, Sambi and Nuno. But he said eight. Um, We, Jesus and Zinchenko in the summer, Fabio Vieira. um, That's another three there. Going into January, we're linked with players. Before I get your take on whether or not you think any of this is going to happen, let's start at the very tippy top. The player that Turner, Turner, Turner as well, Matt Turner. Thanks, Kev. So this fella is someone who we've been linked with a few for a little bit. I said to you on this last show, I think, Kaya, is it going to end up being a Vlaovic Usum Awa type uh, transfer? In that we're linked, we're linked, we're linked. It's happened forever and ever and ever. How really linked are we? Talk us through this. Whether we need him, is he the right player and is this something that you think will happen? It's it's difficult to say, I think, at this time of the window just because it's so early on. I think Shakhtar have been quite clear that they want to get as high a price as possible for him. Shakhtar are in quite a unique position, though, in that they 
obviously with all the terrible things going in Ukraine at the minute, had to let go of a lot of their players for free um, over the summer and over the past few transfer windows. This means that essentially their whole business model is built on signing young Brazilian talents. They bring them over to Europe. They give them a platform in the Champions League and in the Europa League, and then they sell them on to, to bigger European clubs. We've seen that with the likes of Willian in the past. Fernandinho went to Manchester City via Shakhtar. Plenty of other players have done a similar thing. And obviously when all those players left for free, a lot of the Brazilians... Shakhtar couldn't do that anymore, which means that they're now in a position where they're quite cash strapped. So you see their sporting director, Dario Serna, coming out and saying, look, it will cost 100 million. He's similar price to Grealish. Grealish went for 100 million. That strikes me as, as a lot of big talk, which you'd expect from him because he wants to try and put up a tough stance. But I do think Shakhtar would be willing to accept a lot less than that. And uh, speaking to people around the deal and speaking to sort of a couple of people at Arsenal, there does seem to be a little bit of confidence that, that that can be done, but obviously nothing concrete at this stage in the window and everything's still sort of very ifs, buts and maybes. It could drag on. It could be a case of Shakhtar wanting to hold it off for as long as possible to try and get as much money as possible from Arsenal. But um, I do think Arsenal are yeah, interested in, in Madrid. It looks like they are. And all the reports seem to suggest they are. Everyone, A lot of the things I've heard suggest they are. And I think if you look at those forward areas, that's probably where they want to strengthen the most. Obviously, Smith Rowe isn't fully fit yet. Jesus is going to be out for a while. Uh, Reese Nelson has also picked up an injury as well. So if you're looking at those areas, suddenly Arsenal are looking a little bit light. You've got obviously Saka, Martinelli and Nketiah. But beyond that, maybe Marquinhos. And then I don't know if I'm forgetting anyone, Fabio Vieira can play in the attacking positions, I guess. But that would be for me where I think Arsenal need to bolster their their attacking line the most. And it looks like Madrid's the, the player that they're, they're most in for. They've had the ability to surprise us in the past. Look at Fabio Vieira, came out of nowhere. None of us saw that coming. So can't say that's definitely going to be the case but it does look as though that's the the one they're going for and it seems like he's a very good player so fingers crossed that's that's the deal they can get done and super kev you've got no objections to mudrick if he is a signing that we um we do make but you know we talked about that money when you know even the player kind of came out finally alluded to 80 million being ridiculous amount um but Someone that you think will come in, slot into the team quite nicely and be effective right away, hopefully? Yeah, I, I think he's got the type of game that will actually suit us, especially on the break. I think he's he's got great speed. We know Martinelli's got great speed. He's got great speed. Saka can run. Eddie can run. Uh, so, you know, it, whichever permutation, whichever player you pick, Mudrick seems to be the guy who can pick the ball up at fullback and he can go all the way. You know, really exciting player, can play one-twos through through the pitch and he can finish as well. So I, I think he would fit. He fits all the, the boxes with his age, with his talent, with his directness. And I think that could be a really good signing. All right. Um, a player who has come up, this picture courtesy of Premier uh, League News Network, um, a player who your colleague, I think if we signed him, Kaya, Tom Canton might lose his marbles. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong. He's a massive, massive Milinkovic Savic fan, a really good player. Um, the kind of player I think that we really need. What's the reality here? Is this one I should delete from my picture box? <laughs> no, I'll never say that because I, you can never say that with 100% confidence in the transfer. And you can never say it's never going to happen. But um there, there's a, a lot more things that don't seem to make quite as much sense with Milinkovic Savage, just in terms of, I'd say, the age profile, um, probably how much he'd cost in a position where Arsenal were already pretty strong. You look at who he'd be coming in to replace. Would he replace Granit Xhaka in the starting lineup? I'm not so sure. Would he replace Martin Odegaard? No, he's the captain and obviously doesn't play in Thomas Partey's position. So I think he'd be a fantastic player. And I think if he came to Arsenal, it would be a fantastic addition to the squad. And I think. With all due respect to Sambi Lekonga, I think he'd be an upgrade in terms of competition for, for Granite Jack in that sort of left eight role. So, yeah, he would be a, a fantastic addition to the squad. I just I have a few doubts on it. And personally, I've not heard anything that I could concretely report to suggest that I, I think that's going to happen. So I wouldn't want to sort of pour more oil on the fire of that transfer room if, if I haven't got anything to sort of add to it. But listen, there's a lot of reliable sources today and there's, there's something going on there. So you can't you can't dismiss it out of hand. But I personally haven't heard anything to suggest it. And I do just, you know, from the outset, have a few question marks that, that come in just because he's 27. He's been around for a while, um, would cost quite a lot. I don't think that's it. would be, uh, I think, willing to let him go for, for cheap. So interesting decision. And yeah, a few question marks for me on that one. 
Kaya, if. do you think, do, Kaya, do you think if this was a possibility, you'd be looking at the summer as opposed to January? I think it's 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 tough because I think Arsenal probably. I don't think they're anti signing another midfielder to bolster their squad. We saw that with Douglas Luiz in the summer, didn't we? Where they went for him late in the in the window, and things changed throughout the window. And it's quite difficult to say. You know, you pick up all these sorts of injuries, but yeah, a signing like Milinkovic Savic does feel more like a summer signing. Where maybe if Lukonga moves on in the summer, then Arsenal choose to bring in him, him in to replace him or bolster it. Or maybe they've got a bit of a clearer idea about how Charlie Patino is progressing, for example, if they want to bring him back from his lowest spell if he's ready. So. Yeah, I, I'd say probably more summer signing than January. But um, again, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say it with any certainty at the minute. Okay, um, there's a few. Uh, how about I get, maybe I can park this one. Maybe I, this does go into the delete box. Let's <laughs> see if we've got this one right. It seems unrealistic, but my goodness, this is the type of player that would slot into our team quite beautifully. Um, Felix, this seems to me like one of those that's never going to happen. Uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, Kaya, do we park this one, dump it, delete it, pray for it? Which one? I think you can definitely pray for it. I'm not going to stop hey. you from praying for it. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd never, like I say, I know I know it's a bit of a cop-out, it's a bit sitting on the fence, but I'd never say totally delete it because um, I think it'd be a smart signing for Arsenal. He seems to tick a lot of the boxes. Arsenal want a player who can play across the front line, not just someone who can play you know, right wing as a backup to Bakaya Saka. They want somebody who can play across the front line. Rafinha, when they wanted him in the summer, one of the reasons they wanted him because they viewed him as someone who could play false nine and either wing. So they do want someone who's capable of playing in multiple positions and Joao Felix definitely fits into that role. Works very hard, trained under Diego Simeone, so he knows how to defend, which Arteta wants from his centre forward. So stylistically it fits. The thing that obviously makes it seem a little bit difficult is obviously the cost and the wages that Atletico would demand. But, I mean, he does seem to want out of Atletico Madrid, and maybe that would drive down the price. I don't know. Again, I've not heard anything personally on that to suggest anything concrete on João Felix. But, um, yeah, never say never. Kev, he's a special player. You're, you're, you're looking cheeky there, Campbell. Looking <laughs> very... <laughs> look, stirring the... Listen, <laughs> like I always said, so if we could sort out a try before you buy... What an opportunity that will give us. Real opportunity. Look, he wants out of Atletico. Him and the, him and the manager, Simeone, do not see eye to eye. It's, it's, it's Their relationship has broken down. He's been at the World Cup. He's had a decent World Cup. He showed himself. Now, maybe you can dangle that carrot at him, you know, to, to come into Arsenal. He's somebody I'm sure Mikel Arteta rates. But the key is, if you could try before you buy, what an addition to our squad he'd be. Mm -hmm. He would be. That's a major statement signing. You know, that's a that's a that's a major major one. And I'm sure that there's going to be other top clubs that will be in for him should that happen. But I like the try before you buy. It's happened before. Why can't it happen again? Um, here's one for you, Kaya. This won't go away. This is. I want to file this in the. S-H-I-T or get off the pot file. Um, is he coming or not? Can we put this to bed already? Um, no, you can't put it to bed. But um, I think the 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 sort of the talk from Tienemann's camp does seem to be that there's a slight leaning towards a move to Spain, maybe if it is to happen. Although I think that's purely because at the minute he can sign pre-contract agreements with foreign clubs from January 1st, whereas... Uh, Premier League clubs, you can't do that. So maybe that's why that sort of stuff is starting to become a bit more loud now in terms of the voices we're hearing around it. But no, you can't you can't rule it out. Um, Edu's held um, talks with his agent in the past. I don't know whether they've held them again anytime soon. But you do feel as though if they were going to do that deal, it made sense to do it last summer. It was an easy one. I think Tielemans was, was open to the move and I think it seemed like there was some interest on Arsenal's side, but it went quiet. And um, yeah, I think if you're looking at the position he'd come in, would he start? I'm not sure, but he'd be a fantastic backup to someone like a Xhaka, as I said before, with Milinkovic Savic. Can he play as a number six as a backup to Partey? If Partey gets injured, personally, I'm not so sure. I don't think he's defensively sound enough, but I think he'd be a decent addition to Arsenal. Um, having said that, there's a lot of teams interested in him. And if he's available for free in the summer, there'll be even more teams interested in him. And those wages that you'd have to pay to get him to Arsenal would not be cheap. And if Arsenal want to get a midfielder who can bolster that position, then 
maybe they'd be looking at somewhere a bit more cheaper. You do have to bear in mind that I know they've reduced the wage bill a lot, but they've got big contract extensions that they want to sort out for Bakayo Saka, Martinelli, Saliba, and plenty of other players that they want to get done. So would a player like a Tielemans be a priority in terms of the wage bill? Without seeing the direct finances, obviously difficult to say, but that would be something I'd consider for Arsenal. And, you know, it does seem odd they've waited this long to to do the deal and to, to pull the trigger if they are going to. And it would seem strange to, to go in January now rather than going for free in the summer if, if that's what they want from him. Kev, you've always been a fan of Tielemans. Mm. Uh, I would say that you, you were talking about him two seasons ago. It just seems to be one that we've talked a lot about, but maybe at some point, you know, we're going to move on from it. Yeah, I think the sticking point was Leicester, so Kaya, to mm. be honest. I don't think, I think the player wanted to come. I think Arsenal wanted to do the deal. But like we've said many a time, so if the club make life difficult and do not want to sell, listen, they know they're going to get, they're going to get a lot less than they could have in the summer. But they decided to keep a lot of the players. What is it? One player got out? You know what I mean? There was one player who got out. So again, it's up to Leicester. What do Leicester want to do? Leicester found a bit of form before the uh, World Cup break mm -hmm. as well. You're starting to see Tielemans. He scored a couple of screamers, Tielemans. This is what he can do. Um, very good player um, after a difficult start. So, look, again, at the end of the day, we need a squad of players. That's what we need. We're going to be playing uh, Europa League as well as FA Cup. We're going to be playing. With, listen, the, the stakes are, all the chips are in the middle of the table now, Kaya, for the league. We're five points clear. All the chips are in the middle. What you do in January now and, and stuff is going to hopefully have a big say in what happens at the end. And if you if you can bolster your squad in the right way, you know, miracles might just happen. <clears throat> I mean, if we don't, we're going to get to that at the end in the quick fire round. But if we do not, it'll be shambles. Right. Here's a player. Um, in fact, let me do this player next. A little bit last season, we were linked to him. Some Arsenal fans don't think he's good enough, um, think we could do better than Neto. I think he'll still come at a stiff price, Kaya, not cheap. Um, does have that experience, of course. Is this a yay or a nay? I'd be really surprised if that happened in January, just because I think he's been dealing with a lot of injuries this season. He'd just come back from an injury. I think it kept him out for nearly a year. I think he fractured his kneecap, which yep. sounds like one of the most ridiculously painful injuries I've ever heard of in my life. But... Um, yeah, I really liked him in the season before he got injured and I really like what I saw from him. And I think if you can shine as an attacking player in that Wolves side, then you must be doing something right because they do not go forward very often. And they were reliant on him when he was 21 years old, which is something for a Premier League team. And he was standing up to that and he was playing really well. And I, I really like him as a player. I think he's exciting. And again, I spoke earlier about Arsenal wanting someone who can play across the front line. He can play as a false nine, left or right wing, very promising. And obviously, Arsenal have got a lot of Portuguese-speaking players in the squad, so he'd fit into that click quite nicely. But I don't think it would happen um, in January. I, I, you know, as, as close as I'm going to come to uh, I put it in the bin. Uh, <laughs> that might be the one. Yeah. Uh, Kev, you agree with Kyra on this one? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think um, Mudrick is definitely ahead of him. Um, the fact that Neto, Neto can be exciting on his day. Very direct, good player, but suffered with some terrible injuries. And yeah. we can't afford to be signing players who are injury prone because we need them to, to perform in the team. So I think Mudrick is probably the one way ahead of Neto right now. One that's come out of the woodwork and probably because of the World Cup a little bit as well, uh, Torres, a uh, player from Major League Soccer. And I do not think that this is going to be the last that we're seeing of European teams, Kaya, come after players in Major League Soccer. We've seen some good transfers happen over the last, especially 18 months. Um, some major talent coming from South America to Major League Soccer. It has been the kind of transfer strategy and objective of most clubs uh, to look beyond the homegrown, the next layer of players you look at, South American um, what's your take on Torres and this story that is bubbling? Yeah, I mean, look at Almiron. He's an example of that exact pathway that you talk about and obviously got a lot of criticism before this season, but has gone on to become a fantastic player for Newcastle, was in Paraguay, went to Atlanta United, and now is in the Premier League. So 
that is becoming more and more of a pathway for for Premier League players. Arsenal did make contact in terms of just sounding it out as an idea, but I don't know if there's anything beyond that um, at the minute. And those those rumours do seem to have gone a little bit cold. Um, he'd certainly be cheaper than Mudrick or Neto or whoever you're you're looking at in those four positions. So if Arsenal were strapped for cash, which I don't think they are, um, because I think the Cronkies are willing to invest and they've they've signalled that they're willing to invest on several occasions, then you know Torres might be a a more smart option. But listen, Arsenal won't just have one player in mind. Obviously, it does seem as though Mudrick is their first target, but they won't just have one player who they want. No Premier League team, no football team can go to the transfer window with just one player in mind because you can't throw your eggs into one basket. But it does seem as though he's a player they've got interest in. They have made contact in the past, but yeah, those rumours seem to have gone a little bit cold. So um, maybe they'll reignite in January. They, these kind of rumours have a funny habit of reigniting in January, but let's see. <laughs> you know, Kev, it's interesting when you see a player like Almiron who, you know, with a manager who's taken him under his wing and he's playing just so much better and different. Um, a lot of people turn their noses up at MLS players, of course. You saw Matt Turner have a fantastic World Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, kept his uh, his team in 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 at least a couple of games, and England didn't get part, uh, one past him. It's plays like this that are interesting that can turn out to be superstars. Uh, we've seen before. Have you seen anything of Torres? Do you know? Do, are you? Do you want to stay I away from bits. players like this? I, I only saw bits in the in the preseason, mm-hmm. really. If I'm honest, because I, I I don't watch MLS that much, but what I saw. He was he's quality. He's left footer. He's quality. He's, he's good at coming inside. He scored and he looked really lively. I think it was against he played against us and against Chelsea and, and looked really lively in both games. But obviously they're fit and we're not. We're trying to get fit, etc. So you know, you kind of gotta try and look at that. But listen, if you can play, you can play. Good players are good players. I know we've been linked with probably one of the top men who's at Chelsea for the uh, for the American team as well. So uh, that might be next. So I don't want to say too much about that. <laughs> but uh, again, squad player, why not? Young Youngster who's, who's got talent. I, I bet he'll be very coachable as well. That's the other thing. Someone yeah. who'll be coachable. You can coach them up and, and get their ceiling moving. I think it'll be interesting. But I agree with Kaya. Mudrick will probably be the priority. But, you know, if you can get some of these youngsters down the line who are gifted, you bring them in and you, you build them up and, you know, they'll be the mainstay of your squad for years to come. Real quick, before we do move on to the next, and Kev alluded to a player who a lot of Arsenal fans just, maybe maybe they see him too as just another injury-prone player. I just don't think he's... I think he's had a fair crack at Chelsea, but Pulisic, I would take in a hard bite... I'd take him in a heartbeat. You talk about try you know, alone, Kev. You know, get him in, try before you buy. Mm-hmm. He's definitely one. Um, Kaya, are you into that at all? Or would Chelsea yeah, be into I think it? that'd be a smart signing because you're not really bringing him in to start regularly. I don't know whether he'd go for that as someone who'd, who'd probably come in and know that he's not, not coming to start every single game. But right. I think that'd be a smart move. I think if you're looking at sort of players who can play in those positions and you no know, Pulisic, I think his end product is pretty decent I think when it comes to build up it's not always his strongest point but I think he's a decent finisher and he'd probably add five six goals which could be the difference between winning a Premier League title or not winning a Premier League title and we've seen he's got Premier League proven quality he's not always been the most consistent at Chelsea but again I don't think he'd be starting every game for Arsenal so I I think that would be a a smart move but I'm not sure if it's one that's available. Kev there's a difference between being happy and on the bench and just being on the bench and not getting chances. I think there's a difference, right? There's Arteta really molded that part of the season really well. I thought where Martinelli was coming into his own Odegaard was starting to play well. Smith Rowe wasn't getting as many chances before the injury, but then he was coming off the bench, hungry scoring goals, right? I think he's got the ability to be able to do that. And you're, you're the player if you're in a happy place and you're on the bench and you, you're coming on 20 minutes scoring goals versus being unhappy somewhere else, it seems like a no-brainer. But as a player, am I off? Am I off on that? I mean, he's going to want to start, of course. But if there's a choice, no, I, I think it's all down to being rated. If if the manager rates you, and you're coming into a team who 
let's be honest, Arsenal have dominated the first part of the season. When you look at their results and the, I mean, you look at the Arsenal, the Chelsea Arsenal game at Stamford Bridge. You know, Arsenal just dominated from start to finish. You, you know, you, you, if you're a Pulisic and you're coming into that type of Arsenal environment, whether you're whether you start or you're on the bench, coming on, you're you're looking at I'm going to make a difference because we're dominating the game, and and that's what you look at. So it, I, I don't think it actually matters whether he starts or not. I think it's the effect of some of these players that they're going to have if they can get on. So. I, I rate him. I think he's a decent player. I really do. Listen, anybody who's been at Dortmund, made a good career at Dortmund, signed by Chelsea for 60-odd million, he's been kind of in and out because Chelsea can do that. They've had world-class squad for, for a number of years, so they can afford to mix and match. But he's still so young. Yeah. He is still so young. I, I think he's got talent. We saw it in the England game in the World Cup. This kid's got talent, I'm telling and you. Heart. And heart. A lot of people turn their nose up at, at, at American players. Listen, I played with a right few of them. They are real good players with, with heart and they're tough as well. So, listen, that, if Arsenal that, got to start playing him, me, i bring him in. Yeah. And and you're right. I mean, of course, I cover the, 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 the men's team as well, but... And I've seen some of these players come through, like Musa Kaya was someone that you know was in a lot of a lot of our listeners saying Arsenal made a mistake there, shouldn't have let you know Musa go. Uh, and there's been rumours that we might be wanting to back be back in that business. But Tyler Adams, I've wanted him at Arsenal as an option in that midfield for a very long time. Had a great World Cup leader. See how he talks to the journalists and the press when he's asked a really tough question. Um, just really very mature, great attitude. holistic. Great attitude. Great. I mean, they they great all attitude, have mental attitude, everything. But very strong, very strong. So, uh, I w I wouldn't mind being in that business. Right. Here's a player that may not have had a good attitude about a year and a bit ago. Did something very naughty and disgusting. However, he was prior to that a player who was on my shopping list two years ago. Uh, Kaya. And Kev was a fan of his, and we did a show with Dan Potts, actually, and he was on Dan's shopping list as well. Circle back to now, he did have a big injury. Are we sure that Marcus Turam is the same player he was maybe two years ago? And should we be in the business of a Turam? I wonder where you were going there when you started with that build-up when he did something uh -huh. very naughty. Um, he yeah. spat at someone, didn't he? He had a very unsavory spitting. Oh, I thought you were talking about his dive in the final yesterday. Oh, um, uh, well, that yeah. too. That too, yeah. Not not a great uh, rap sheet. But um, yeah, I think he, he'd be a, a solid signing for Arsenal. Again, you talk about players who can play across the front line. At, at Brisson Munch and Gladbach, he's played false nine, either wing, can do that. And I thought he looked really good for France when he came on yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hadn't seen an awful lot of him before that, I have to admit. But he's someone who's been linked with Arsenal for so long now. It feels like going back to when I think he was at, I can't what French club, I want to say it was Lille he was at maybe before... Munch and Gladbach, and um, going back all that time, he's been linked with Arsenal for for a while now, and I think he's the kind of player that Arsenal seems to have picked up in the past, and he's, he, I think he'd be a, a good addition to the squad. I'm pretty sure he's out of contract at the end of this season, mm -hmm. which I think would also potentially make a deal a lot more easy to do. Munch and Gladbach wouldn't let one wouldn't want to let him go for free, sorry. So maybe that would that would make sense. I think it'd be a smart move. He looks like a goal threat. I thought he looked really good for France in the World Cup whenever I saw him, and Arsenal need players, as much as they need someone who they want to be troubling the first team, they need someone who can sort of be in and around it and also carry a threat, which is slightly different to, to what they've got. And I think Turan would offer that. He's a bit more physical than some of the other wingers that yes. Arsenal have in the squad, which I think is always a nice addition. And I think that's st that would stand him in good stead for the Premier League. And he looks like he works quite hard as well, which Shikhal Arteta would love. So, yeah, I think that'd be a, a decent signing. And, yeah, we'll see. Kev, I loved watching... Taram Senior play football. Talk about Generation Xers and uh, and players that you just love to watch. Uh, Chris Moss, by the way, thinks, Kaya and Kev, that we should be focusing on his younger brother and not be in the Marcus business. Kev, I told you when I presented Marcus Taram as an option that he reminds me of a hybrid Kevin Campbell and Ian Wright. There's something about him where he just has that lower sense of gravity. He's, he's fast. He's a, he thinks, but he he's I don't know. He's technically very good. 
strong. What's your take on Turam? Yeah, I think he's he he could be a good addition. Um, someone who, again, someone who can play across the front and someone who will give us a bit of physical presence up there because although Eddie's been working on his physique and looks a bit stronger, you know, you can't be a big one. You know, somebody who's bigger, stronger and, and more physical, that will keep defences on their toes, that's for sure. So, and again, it's it's it will be a, a fair deal because it will be pretty cheap. Because he's only got six mm -hmm. months left of his contract. So it could be a good deal to be done. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, those were my players that I've heard the most of um, in terms of, you know, what we're looking at, Kaya. Uh, I'm going to ask you a two-prong question here. Who have I missed? And Tammy, our chief like officer, said very early on in the show, and I saved it, Tam, and many others, including myself, uh, have said that the most important signings uh, that we need to make in January or whenever, as soon as humanly possible, are uh, this guy, unlucky, um, William, that you did not win a World Cup. I have a feeling you will be back because of another player called Kylian Mbappe. Uh, then this guy, and of course, this guy. What is the update? You get hear those horrible little rumours of Manchester City brewing Kaya. Don't ruin my Christmas here. Does Saka want to stay? Go? Are they waiting to find out if we have Champions League football? The These Saka three. Would, what's, what's yeah, sorry. Saka would love to stay. I think he said he shares the confidence of Mikel Arteta. Arteta said that he wants him to stay. He said he's confident that he'll be able to stay. That does seem like a matter of time. That deal. And even if you're looking at those, the Manchester City wanting him, Liverpool wanting him, would he leave for Liverpool now? I'm not so sure. Would he go to Manchester City now and not necessarily be the regular starter and sort of game changer that he is at Arsenal? Again, I'm not so sure. He's Arsenal fan, Arsenal boy, come through the academy, been with the club since he was eight. So I think he wants to stay. But again, that's just about, I think, his agent working hard to get him the terms that he deserves, which I think he's very much entitled to at this stage in his career. It's, it's probably mm. going to be the first massive contract of his Arsenal career. His The contract he's on now is obviously one... He signed immediately after breaking into the first team that summer, the COVID summer, where he broke into the first team and was obviously a regular after Mikel Arteta arrived. So he'll be wanting much more sort of generous terms. And I think he's perfectly entitled to, to ask for those. Martinelli, similar, Arsenal aren't too worried about that. And I think the reason they're not too worried about that is they have the option to extend it by a further two years. So his deal currently expires in 2024, but they have the plus two option. So really it's, it's 2026. And, I don't think Arsenal will allow it to, to to dwindle on that long. And there's sort of, with these contract negotiations, and Kev will be able to, to comment on this better than me, but there's sort of an understanding and good faith that if, if a player plays well enough to, to earn new terms, then generally the club won't sort of, in good faith, let them carry on to the end of their contract on the lesser terms. They'll look to negotiate that and reward him for his contribution in the team. And again, when Martinelli signed his current deal, wasn't a first-team regular, now is a first-team regular. So that's something that Arsenal will want to to get sorted out relatively soon. But I'd say of the three, that's probably the one that's the least urgent. The The one where I can't really give a certainty is William Saliba right now. That's purely because Arsenal were wanting, and Arsenal and Saliba were both wanting to wait and see what happened in the World Cup. Obviously, if he had come back a World Cup winner, then he probably would have been able to slap a few extra zeros on his ways demands. And I think that's fair enough. Now, I don't know whether that is slightly different and obviously didn't play very much in the World Cup. So I wonder if that will have impacted things slightly, if, if at at all. So listen, he'll come back to Arsenal. We'll be playing every week. And if Arsenal win the Premier League and if Arsenal qualify for Champions League, you'd like to think he'll want to stay. But he'll only have one year left on his deal. So Arsenal have the option to extend. It expires in 2023, but they have the option to extend. You would assume they'd, they'll take that up and not let him expire at the end of the season that would be shocking if they did and I'm, I'm sure they will do those talks are sort of ongoing I think there's been a contract offer on the table but again you know why would Saliba commit to a new deal now if you're in his camp why would you commit now I think you'd probably look to wait and just see if you can get a slightly better deal towards the end of the season I think again perfectly entitled to do that playing some of the best football I think we've seen from a centre-back in the Premier League this season I'd argue he's up there with the best if not the best centre-back in the Premier League this year so maybe that's one that we wait until the summer and see it happen then. But Saka, relatively confident on. Same with Martinelli, Saliba, less so. But I think that's one where maybe time will tell. 
five. You're not going to let him out the building, Saliba. No chance. You're not going to let him out the building. Um, you've got the option of a of an extra year. But what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to tie him down properly to a to a, a big contract. So if if the worst was to happen further down the line, then you, somebody's going to have to pay you an absolute king's ransom. Um, but it's that feeling, that feeling. Fair enough, he went to the World Cup. You don't negotiate during the World Cup because, as you said, quite rightly said, Kaya, you might have him to be putting some more zeros on it because if he if he gets in and he, he makes yeah. a real big name for himself, you can imagine that the, 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 the type of clubs who's going to be really chomping at the bit. So you give him every opportunity to to, to be a star um, at the World Cup. He didn't quite obviously play as much as he would have liked or whatever, but he comes back into the fold and we'll see how it goes. But Arsenal are going to negotiate right with him. Let's see how the season goes with him. Saka, that's going to get done. Martinelli, that's going to get done. Both of these boys have outplayed their contracts. Saliba's outplayed his contract for the best part of this season anyway. So I could see that being done. That would probably be the last one to be done. And it might take it until the summer. But, you know, you never know. We might be champions. So that might have to be zero <laughs> on. Ev, that sounds so weird when you say it out loud. You know, but it's true. So, if, you know, if he if he's going to add to his bargaining power, why not be champion? No. Be a champion. <laughs> Let's all um, the bargaining chips. I've got a few questions for you guys just rolling off from some of the stuff that we've been talking about before we get to the quick fire round, okay? So we'll start with Greek commander here. Kaya, for you first. Pepe, there's someone who is on loan. Someone tried him. Are they going to buy him or is he coming back? Um, is that back as in in January or is that back at the end of the season? I think any time. Okay. Uh, January, I'd say almost certainly not. Um, I'm pretty sure there's no recall clause in that loan. And I think he'll want to stay out on loan until the end of the season. He's playing pretty regularly for Nice. And I think he's got a decent scoring record out there. I can't remember the exact specifics, but last time I checked, he looked like he was doing all right for them. Uh, a lot of penalties, um, as we you know we know from Arsenal, that does tend to, to bolster his goal stats. And um, I, I've seen him a couple of times playing for Nice. And he, he doesn't look very different in the sense that is sort of, you can see there's a very talented player there, but I've never seen a such a raw 27 year old if that makes sense it's a very confusing player to watch he's clearly got a lot of talent but just when it comes to the consistency and all the issues that we had with Pepe when he was at Arsenal they still need to be ironed out and you know, listen if he continues to do well in Liga, and then maybe Arsenal will be able to get a fee for him I don't think he'll be doing as good as Arsenal might have hoped in the sense that if he'd gone to Liga and really smashed it this season like he did in his final season with Lille then maybe you'd have been looking at a big big transfer fee towards the end of the year but Arsenal will look to sell him in the summer. I'd be shocked if he came back. He'll have uh, one year left in his deal. He'll be on big, big wages as well. So Arsenal will look to, to try and move him on if possible. And depending on how well he does at Nice, then they'll hopefully get a really good fee for him. But if he continues um, sort of at this level, I'd be shocked if they get anything north of 20 million. But we'll see. Man, yeah, he's played 12 matches this season, has scored four goals. Uh, Kev, Don Juan and some other listeners were like, whoa, I forgot about Pepe. Have you forgotten about Pepe? No. Top of the league, five points would... clear? Why not? I mean, I wouldn't I yeah, blame not, you, Kev. No, not, for, not forgotten about him, but he's, he doesn't have a future at the club. So it's that simple. Right. The, the only reason he comes back is really to is, is if, you know, the, the clubs don't want him. That's the only reason he comes back to pick his boots up. Or we had a major injury crisis, unlike anything no, no, that's been no, seen before that. in the Premier no, League. Not, not even that. He's not coming back. Try, All right. Mikel Arteta has tried him. Sin him. No. Okay. A play that keeps coming up, and I just don't see it. To me, I think he's a really good player. He's decent. But does he elevate our team to take us to the next level? I would say two years ago, I'd been all, on, on, all in on this player, Kaya. But right now, to me, he blows hot and cold. For five games, everyone's raving about him. And then there's 15 games that go by where no one's talking about Zaha. Are we in this game or not? Should we be in this game or not? Do you agree or disagree with me? I think Zaha would be a superb addition to, to Arsenal. Um, I think he's got the kind of ability on the break that every single defender in world football is terrified of in the sense that he's an excellent close control dribbler. 
Um, he can be clinical. I know you say that he, he goes through games where you don't really hear about him, but I think he's pretty clinical. He normally hits double figures for a season. And again, if you look at what Arsenal need to probably fire them to the the Premier League title, you're looking at well, how many goals do you want from a January signing who's a forward? Maybe between six to eight, possibly 10, if you're really, really sort of asking for a lot. And I think you'd back Zaha to get that in the second half of the season. Obviously, he's out of contract with Palace in the summer. But if you look at Arsenal's um, transfer policy of signing young players, Wilf is, I think, 30, maybe 31. That doesn't fit into that. He's also would... Quite rightly, this is going to be the last big contract of his career, so he'll be asking for quite big wages. And as a, a free transfer in the summer, and as a free transfer, sort of, um, sorry, a much diminished transfer in January, he'll be asking for massive wages, which I don't know if Arsenal will be willing to give him, especially when you consider those negotiations for Saka and Martinelli. Because if let's just hypothetically say Zaha comes in, I think he's on over a hundred grand a week already at Palace, and let's say he comes in on. 150 and this is not any information i've heard it's just a hypothetical number i plucked out the sky but if saka and martinelli see that they'll be saying well hang on we want at least 200 then if that's the case and obviously arsenal won't want to try and hamstring themselves in that negotiation so i think it'd be a fantastic signing if there weren't all those things counting against him but i think in practicality it just doesn't quite work unfortunately Kev, am I being unfair? Uh, because we always, I always say to you, Kev, I want us to sign more Premier League proven players, especially the quality of a Jesus or a Zinchenko, right? And here is a ready-made Premier League experienced player, but I'm not sure he's an upgrade. Uh, fair or foul, would you still take him? 100%. And by the way, how about he's done it year in, year out for Crystal Palace. And remember, he's playing at Crystal Palace, not, not for the Arsenal, he's playing at Crystal Palace. So somebody like that who could influence games for Crystal Palace, who, no disrespect, would then at Arsenal. So a team like Arsenal who dominates... Is that well, why he shines, though? Well, you know how some players really shine in average teams and then they go to better no, teams? It's like Grealish, right? He's sh he was shining at Villa. He hasn't really no, done much. No, but what I'm saying is, for a player like Zaha, a team like Arsenal who dominate the ball will be able to get Zaha on the ball in key positions more. Mm. That's my point. Crystal Palace will find themselves under the pump and then obviously Zaha's got to do a bit because they need him to release, you know, take them from one end of the pitch to the other, or they need a bit of magic from him. That's fair. But you think about it. you got Saka. Let's just say you got Saka on the right-hand side and you got Zaha on the left. Who do you double team? We've seen, we've seen Saka get the ball and there'd be three players over that side. You shift the ball quickly to the other side, he's going to be 1v1. That's what we want. We want Martinelli 1v1 or we want Saka 1v1 whether it's Modric or Zaha, we want them 1v1, so that's what their ability is, being able to dribble and beat people. I think Zaha also can play number nine just as, just as well because he's a real threat. And yeah, his age isn't, doesn't tie in. You're right there, Kaya. His age doesn't tie in, but his ability does. And sometimes you have to make signings for now. You know, you can't always yeah. be buying the potential because do we want to win it in a few years' time or do we want to win it now? We want to win it now. So I, I think he'll be a great addition. No, I really agree with that. And I think, listen, Arsenal wouldn't have been expecting to get themselves into a position where they're five points clear at the top of the Premier League coming into the start of the season. I don't think anyone really saw a title challenge on the horizon. Having said that, Arsenal probably weren't expecting to be as close run for the Champions League last season. And lots of people were saying they needed a signing for then and there to get a centre forward in, to bring in the guy just for six months to tide them over. And they didn't do it. And I think we've seen what Edu and what Arteta are willing to do in terms of what they'll do in the transfer market. I don't think they'll they'll compromise the whole project thing, if you like. I, it, as much as I think he'd be a superb signing, Wilfred Zaha, and I think I'd really love to see him at the Emirates. I just... I just can't see it happening from Arsenal. It would be so out of character for them to go out and sign a player like that right now, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, he's in, I think I'm, I've got Manchester United PTSD, but I think he went there maybe too soon, Kevin Kaya. And it maybe, didn't yeah, work. maybe. Yeah, it didn't Transition work out. as well, Solf. Yeah. Transition. They were, they were in a transitional period. They were. And, and yeah. don't forget, you know, Solf, so Alex Ferguson signed him and then David Moyes took over. 
So, you know, yeah. that was on a on a young guy like that. That was tough. All right, I've got a couple more of your questions before we get to a super quick fire round and get these guys out. Stay with us. Um, Kevin and I do have an announcement to make at the very end. Uh, you won't want to miss that either. Uh, okay, so here's one for you guys from Mark. Uh, Kaya, uh, this one's for Kaya. Does Kaya have any inside info on why Edu and Arteta went to see Stan and Josh a couple of weeks ago? Money, money, money. <laughs> must be funny. <laughs> I don't imagine, I, yeah, I imagine that would have come up in conversation at some I point. I tell you, Kaya, it's definitely not to see the Rams play this year because really? they are garbage, okay? Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I imagine, you know, Arteta is a big fan of American sports. He's got that good relationship with Sean McVay, but like you say, I don't think they would have really been there for that. Um, I'm sure transfers would have come up. I'm sure they would have had to present them the uh, the – January transfer plans and I'm sure the Cronkies would have been amenable to what Arsenal are trying to do. I think the Cronkies understand and we saw this in their statement for the financials that were released a, a, was it a, the last month. Their aim in the long run is to make Arsenal a, a self-sustaining business and I think whereas in the past they thought the way to do that was spend just the minimum amount possible to get them in the Champions League and then um, sort of hope that the club kind of takes care of itself from that. I think now the penny seems to have dropped in a bit. You have to speculate to accumulate a bit. So you have to spend a bit in the short term to make Arsenal a sustainable Champions League team in the long term. And I think they understand that. And I think they understand that if Arsenal become Premier League winners, then their ability to attract the very best talent from across the world suddenly becomes a lot easier. And on top of that, they start making a lot more money. And people criticise the Cronkies for just being Arsenal as a cash cow. And I think in the past that's been fair. But at the end of the day, they are businessmen and they do want to make money from the club. But... It does seem as though, you know, from their actions over the past few transfer windows, they they understand that, you know, if Arsenal are going to be a long-term financially viable club and self-sustainable club that they want them to be, then they need to be challenging up for the, the top trophies. And the way they do that is by investing. And it seems they're willing to do that. The sort of the noises I've heard from speaking to people at Arsenal is that they're willing to do that in January. And it's up to Arteta and Eddie to, to find the right deals. So I assume that's what they would have been talking about. I don't know. Sorry to whoever it was asked a question. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, but I, I don't know the details specifically of that conversation. I'm sure Arteta Mark, would ask yeah, him. Mark, Mark, sorry, Mark. Mark I, I'm sure Arteta would say it was private, so he wouldn't tell us anything about that. But I'd assume transfers would have come up. I'd assume money would have come up. But those those three, the Cronkies, Edu, Arteta, have a fantastic working relationship from everything you hear. So I'd be very surprised if it was anything other than productive talks. Okay, this is great stuff. 340 of you in live chat on this fine Monday evening. The Highbury squad is back. Our normal schedule will be resuming. The Arsenal will be back in a week's time. Boxing Day, we face West Ham United. And here we go with our quick fire section for Kaya and Super Kev. Um, and it's more of an agree or disagree with me on this one. And it is quick fire. But would you both agree? that the most under-pressure player coming into the final act of the season, in definitely from December to March onwards, is Eddie. Super Kev, agree or disagree? Under fire, you can say that solely just because of who he's becoming in the team for. Um, so, yeah, but I think that's a bit unfair because Eddie... He's, he's waited his turn. He gets a chance. And you just never know. I tell you, you just never know. He might hit a vein. That's what we need him to do. I am. What's your take? I think he probably is under a lot of pressure. And that's because I think Arsenal fans hold him to quite unfair standards. Jesus is one of the best centre forwards in the Premier League and one of the, the best kind of signings Arsenal could have made. I don't think it's fair to expect Eddie to be able to replicate that. If Eddie was able to replicate that, he probably wouldn't be backup striker as Arsenal. That's probably the the reality of it. So I think what Arsenal fans need to do now is get behind Eddie. And I saw a lot of criticism of him after the Juventus game. Sorry, I know this is quick fire. I'm going a bit of a rant here, but I, love I saw it. a lot of criticism of him after the Juventus game. And that chance he missed, I think, where he hit the post and he intercepts. Um, I think Juventus are playing out from the back. But the fact that Eddie's even getting in those positions is a sign of the fact that he's sort of pressing really well and doing a lot of the side of the game that Jesus does really well. And Jesus wasn't exactly scoring hatfuls of goals either. So when Eddie comes into the side, I don't think we necessarily need him to be scoring goals and goals and goals. Obviously, we want him to be scoring lots, but 
I don't think the pressure needs to be on him as severely as it will be. Having said that, I feel like you're sort of you're fighting a losing battle telling Arsenal fans not to put the pressure on Eddie Nketiah because I think even after the end of last season, I'd argue there's a, a silent majority and becoming even more louder that they're not fully convinced by Eddie. And I'm hoping that he can turn them around. I'm hoping he can convince them the other way. And listen, whenever he's had a run in the first team with the first team players around him, he's done well. So hopefully he can have another one of those in the next couple of months. We got yeah. a whiz, Kaya. We got a win. That's the key. The key is yeah. we got to win. Eddie yeah. needs to chip in, but the team has to be winning. Totally agree. And this is a massive opportunity for him to be a cult hero. Come on, Eddie. Um, we're all rooting for you. Um, okay. This player, I believe, regardless of who we sign in January, I believe this player will have the most impact and feel like a new signing coming back. Agree or disagree that Mr. Emil Smith, I built up my guns row, is ready, Kaya, to come back to the Arsenal and have a major impact in this final act of the season. Wholeheartedly agree. I think if you look at Smith Rowe's goal scoring record last season, he was on fire before the injuries came along. And even after the injuries came along, he was still scoring goals off the bench. So if you look at what Arsenal need in the second half of the season with Jesus out, they need players who can contribute from all over the pitch. And they're going to be looking to break teams down. They're going to be looking to try and win all these games, as Kev was saying. And players like Emil Smith Rowe are game winners. Simple as that. They score goals. That's the most difficult part of the game to do. So, yes, I think he's going to be a really important addition. Hopefully, he doesn't need too much time to adapt after three months out. It's a long time, but hopefully he can get back into the swing of things quite quickly. Unfortunately, he's not been training much over the past couple of days. So that was a bit of a worry, but hopefully he'll be back. Uh, I think January is when they're hoping he'll be back for. So fingers crossed he'll be back fit and firing by then. Yeah, super care. It's more hope, uh more hope. For me, it's more hope that he returns how he was. And um, he looks to have built his body up, which is great. Um, we, Why, we need Kev? Him is that because be of the, the, that of yeah, the injury because of that the he time, sustained? And the time and the level now. You know, the level where it is now isn't where... When, when he got injured and where it is now, it's not the same. So... Yeah. I just, I just hope he can hit the ground running. I hope he can get himself back fit to the end of the season and prove to be a really good addition in the squad. But do you know what, Sophie? I think you look at, you look at the way Arsenal have been playing, the way they've been training. They've, they've looked lively. They've looked aggressive. They've looked hungry. And I don't know whether Smith Rowe will be able to really pick up the pace of the of the Premier League, how we play it right now. I hope he does because I, I rate him highly. You know I rate him highly, but it's going to be difficult for him. Yeah, and very honest and candid there, Kev. Uh, it's not easy, especially to come back from the injury, and he's had a few, hasn't he? And yeah. um, we just hope. Okay, got a couple more for you guys. Someone who may have become a little bit of a forgotten man, but with injuries in that position, I don't think his Arsenal story is over just yet. Kaya, the Tesco bag carrying <laughs> Braveheart will have a part to play in the Arsenal's final act of the season. It's not over yet for KT. Am I talking out my backside or my upside? What a picture that is. I think <laughs> the fact that he was third choice in the first half of the season is not a great sign for him. But Tommy Asi is struggling with the hamstring problems. Inchenko is struggling with muscle issues. And Arsenal are going to be playing a game every three days, more or less, between now and March. So Tierney's going to have his part to play. And interestingly, against Juventus, he was doing that thing of coming in field, almost standing on the centre circle like we see Zinchenko do. And he's never going to be as good as Zinchenko on the ball. He's not as technically gifted. And that's because he wasn't formerly a number 10 like Zinchenko was. So different kind of player. But I think... Tierney does have a huge part to play in the second half of the season. And, you know, he already has had a big part to play. And I don't think Arteta's got any issues with throwing him in. I think he's been really professional about the way he's been left out of the squad. Um, sorry, the team in the first half of the season. He could have easily thrown his toys out of the pram, but he's not done that. He's kept working hard. And I think hopefully in the second half of the season, that'll be his time to shine. And listen, we've not had him for the back end of the past two seasons. It'd be nice to have him this time around. And hopefully that'll be the difference. And Kev, won't it be interesting to see how the season does end with a fit Kieran Tierney available to us, even if it's 20 minutes at the end or it's 70 minutes at the beginning, having him 
be part of this team as we, you know, go for the jugular is so important. One thing agree? we know, both. One thing we know, it's a squad game. It's a squad game now. Just having the same players play week in, week out is, is not how it's going to work at Arsenal right now. Kieran Tierney's got his part to play. He will get his game time. He will. There will be times where he's on the bench, 100%, because there's going to be a rotation of players because of, as Kaya said, games every three, three days up until March or whatever. So you've got to try and protect the players. We've, we've seen that happen earlier on in the season and it kind of we went a bit dead against PSV away. You could see it has caught up with the team a little bit. But what we need to do is try and protect them as best we can with a couple of additions in, in January that will help. Kieran Tien is a good player. He'll be fine. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. This is the last one here. I did have a few more, but we're running out of time and we've got to let Kaya go in just a sec. So this is the one, I think one of the biggest ones of all, regardless of injuries, regardless of who is at his disposal. This final act of the season will be the most pressure Mikel Arteta has felt since becoming the Arsenal Football Club manager. It's do or die. People keep talking about the title, Kaya, but some of us just want to finish in a Champions League spot. Surely the wheels won't fall off that badly, and surely Mikel Arteta will see it through and finally get Champions League football. Is this going to be the most pressure he's felt? I don't think he's under any pressure, really, in the sense that I don't think anyone was expecting Arsenal to be in a title race. I think everyone was hoping for top four. As far as I'm concerned, anything beyond that is a bonus. And look, if Arsenal are still in the title race come April, May, then of course the press will ramp up. And of course, th there'll be some intense games. And those two games against Manchester City in the second half of the season are going to be huge. But I don't think he's under pressure. I think he's sort of in a low, no lose situation because if Arsenal come second or third you know I, I can't see them coming third but if they come second this season then that's way better than anyone was expecting even third is better than anyone was expecting I think fourth was where most people had Arsenal and some very optimistic people had them third so I don't view Arteta as being under too much pressure I think he's gonna hopefully get things right in the second half of the season there have been some pressure games in the past I think to Villarreal semi-final in the Europa League I think arguably the North London derby last season where he's got things wrong in big games but I think he's learning and I think he learns very quickly. And that's one of his definitely his best skills as a manager. So hopefully he'll get things right. But I don't think he's under too much pressure. And I don't think he should be under too much pressure either. Kev, shouldn't a manager who spent over 350 million gazillion dollars and has been given the keys to the kingdom and backed to the hilt, should he feel some pressure or is it too he's cozy? Under, he's under pressure. Of course he's under pressure. <laughs> of course he's under pressure. But you know what, Sophie? Here's one thing about football. There's bad pressure and there's good pressure. Bad pressure is losing the first three games last season. Do you remember all what was going around then? Now, oh, that's yeah. bad. now that's bad pressure because that's stuff that will keep you awake at night as a manager. Being five points clear at the top, going into West Ham at home on Boxing Day, there's going to be pressure to perform. Pressure to keep winning, etc. Of course there are. But you know what? That's the good pressure. That's good pressure for this team. He's, he believes in his team. January's coming where he knows he can make a couple of additions. And just to answer Mark's question, of course him and Edu went out there to find out about the transfer <laughs> budget. They were, that's why they went. They went, listen, if we can get these players in in January, will you back us? And it all seemed to be hunky-dory. So do you know what? Why not, So Let Mikaleta feel the good pressure of Arsenal because he's had all the other pressure. Mm. Let him feel some of the good pressure. I love that. Good pressure versus bad pressure. It's so true. It exists. You know, I mean, it, it, in sports as well. And and even like in uh, my in, in film, like you're only as good as your last movie, your last right. opening. You know, you're on to the next one. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's incredible. Look at Jurgen Klopp. He's done so many great things for Liverpool and some people calling for his head this season yeah. because, you know, they've dipped. So, no, it's a, it's an interesting angle. Right, Kaya, brilliant tonight. Performance. Talk about performances. Yet again. again. Yet again, so. I mean, Yet seriously. Thank Try you. before you buy. We want to buy him. <laughs> <laughs> 
Forget Zhao <laughs> Felix. We want Kaya in. Come on. We want Kaya. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be a lot cheaper. I'd be a lot cheaper. Oh, yes. Man. Oh, Kaya, brilliant stuff. Um, I do believe. Please tell me I got your handle right. Sometimes I don't know to make the old one, mistake. Yeah. Okay, Britt. And what's coming up? What are you writing about this week? And before you leave, because we've got a couple of housekeeping things to do at the very end. Don't leave everyone because we've got some bits to do. But Kaya's going to leave us uh, right now. What's happening this week? And give us your prediction for West Ham. Uh, yeah, OK, we've got the press conference coming up on Thursday for Mikel Arteta before the game. So keep an eye on that. And then um, I've got a couple of days off now um, because I've been working more or less for the past uh, six weeks of that stuff. And so I'm going to take a couple of days off and then press conference on Thursday and then Christmas and then Boxing Day. And then it all starts all over again. The madness Brilliant. starts all over again. So Brilliant. Yeah, looking forward to that. You fancy a win? Against West, against West Ham, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, West Ham, I, as far as I know, I think Scamacca is injured. I think Antonio is struggling with his fitness as well. And I think Arsenal should have enough to beat them. So I'd say maybe 2-0 to Arsenal, I'm going to say tentatively. But it's, it's it's over a week before the game. Well, it's a week before the game. So a week, a week today. I not a prediction that far in advance, but let's say 2-0 to the Arsenal. Yeah, a, a team at West Ham that we do like playing against. I think in since the inception of the Premier League, they've, only beaten us eight times. That's 30 years of football. So I'm it, expecting though. a big one. Uh, right, Kaya, thanks so much for joining. You take care. You have a very merry, merry Christmas. Have you been a good boy? Are you going to get good stuff from Santa? I believe Fingers Kaya's crossed. been a good boy. Fingers crossed. I've got a wish, Arsenal related, that they win the Premier League. That's my Christmas wish. So fingers crossed that comes true in the second half of the season. Okay, we absolutely love that. Um, Kaya from Football London, thanks so much for joining. And Cheers, we look forward to seeing you again soon. At Cheers, ease. Guys. Merry Christmas. At ease, mate. Cheers, Bye. pal. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Great stuff he's from Kyle. I, I like him. He's a good, yeah, good lad. I love him too. He's so good. Really, really good. And the listeners have really appreciated him. Right. Uh, we've got thanks for Kaya. More thanks, more thanks. Let's get them all up. Um, he's just such a top shelf, top shelf guy. And we adore having him on the show. Uh, Kevin and I will probably do predictions a little bit later on this week. Mm. Um, and so stay, stay, uh, stay looking out for those. Right. We promised you that this will be another show. Monday Madness Super Kev is here. The advisory board have taken it all into consideration. It is time to give away another Highbury Squad coin. As you guys know, we've created this gem. About to go grab it. Please hold the line. The number you are calling knows you are waiting. Please hold. I would love to do that job, Kev. Please hold the line. The number you are calling knows you are waiting. Huh? They still do that. So it's not a job. <laughs> no, I know, but I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that recording. Okay, and that here is the gem. Is, uh... The gem itself. Signed by Super Kevin Campbell. And let me tell you something. No coin is given without the approval of this legend, this icon, who wore the shirt, kissed the badge, scored some bangers for the Gunners and other teams as well. Super Kev, who is the next recipient of said coin. Well, after much deliberation, um, there was a unanimous vote of one by me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and believe it or not, the most lovable man in the chat is going to go to Guna Russ. Not only Guna Russ for your art, but for hu your humanity and your caring. You know what you've done. You helped a, a, a fellow colleague who was in distress, big distress, and you've done all you can to help. And you know what? I love humanitarian. I love people thinking of others. And that swayed it big time. Guna Ross. Your art was better than Newman's as well, by the way. So well done. All right. He's getting a lot of love. And of course, there's some disdain in the room. There always is. All right. Let's um, see it. Come on. Let's <laughs> see it. Come on. But Guna Ross also, he's our regular Banksy. Um, under the bridge on the way to the Tollington. Uh, this guy is an incredible artist. Okay. 
He also did this for us. He has a real, he's a phenomenal photographer. It does amazing things. Um, and he helps a few of us podcasters getting some good old 10 by eights and stuff. He loves using the Canon as a, a piece. He photographs it, then he works on the art as well. Um, and this piece that he did, uh, Ashburton Army inspired, is brilliant. Quality, what I also quality. love about this choice, Kev, is that Guna Russ uh, represents a generation of, we have Guna Rose and Guna Russ in the house, but it is Guna Russ who has won the coin. Yeah, uh, he Guna Rose, unfortunately. Guna Rose, um, your time will come. Uh, he also represents Generation X slash Baby Boomer. He's seen it all. The dude has been following Arsenal home and away. I don't know for how many years now, Kev. Um, but, you know, he's a really cool guy. And Guna Russ, well done. You're going to enjoy your coin. It's on its way over to you, just like the blankety blank check for compare. Well done. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> well done, oh. Guna Russ. Well done. Well, Far brilliant reserve. stuff. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. So Guna Russ wins and everyone on this show always wins. And um, we just are thankful to Zenith for helping us put together this project together with Super Kev. It was his idea to give away um, uh, our coin to people in our community. Keep writing to us, thehybridsquad at gmail.com. Christmas isn't even here yet. This is going on until New Year's Eve. Hey, and listen, be ready for the end of the week. Kev, what do you think? It's wonderful. Wonderful. It looks good, right? And then yeah, it looks wonderful. The, the beanie, yeah. the Highbury Squad beanie. Love it. Love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Love My Brock, the next stuff's on the way. Good. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, <laughs> got it good. all happening. Uh, Kev, that's it. I think that's all we got time for. Great show with Kaya. Well done, Guna Russ. Keep the nominations coming, everybody. Arnie, who I showed you guys a picture of with his son with their Christmas sweaters, sent us the picture. So the advisory board is now considering whether Arnie gets a book. So we'll update you on that a little bit later on this week. You never Kev. know. There might, there, might be a, there might be a tribunal on that. <laughs> there uh, might Kev. be a tribunal on that. What haven't I asked you that you want to say? Nothing. We've covered everything. We we covered. We're going to start getting back to a bit more normal normality, yes. which is what we want. Yes. Um, and to get this community going with when the football starts, I think that's really important, especially Christmas time. Um, important time. Thank God. Thank goodness. Thank God. Well done, everyone. I'm going to hand it over to Super Kev right now. We're out. Monday Madness. Back at you. We've got Demi and Ariaga coming up later on this week to talk women's football. We're sending all of our love to Beth Mead. And Vivian Miedemar, horrible injuries, horrible news for Arsenal women. We'll cover that later on this week. Super Kev, it's over to you. Gooners, Highbury squatters, squaddies, ladies, gentlemen, and children, whoever's watching this, always remember to look after yourselves, tell your loved ones you love them, and be kind. Do a Vinny. Hit it, even if you're watching it after the event. Hit that like button and do us proud, or else I broke the neck. Anyway, goodwill to everybody from the hostess with the mostest, me, Super Kev, Vinny, Vespa, and everybody connected with the Ivory Squad. Make sure you have an absolutely fantastic day, evening, night, morning. Just have a nice time. So you know what comes next, squaddies. At ease, squaddies. At ease. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. <laughs>